The VGK was developed by a gentleman by the name of Jacob Bunder. And Jacob had worked on some other knees prior to this, but had an inspiration. He also had a goal. He's traveled quite a bit in the world, and he found that in places like India, Pakistan, South Africa, and a few other places that there is really a need, if there ever was a need, to have an intelligent knee in these countries that have uneven terrain, dirt, wet, you know, bad weather, bad environment, everything that you don't want to do with electronics. But they need this because of the world they live in. They don't live on nice flat ADA type streets. They don't live in clean areas. They live where it's dirty. So his goal was to develop a knee that gave them incredible stance stability, easy walking, and would tolerate poor conditions. And I think he's achieved this. I think this is an example of something going beyond and out of the box. He has made a fluid intelligent, much in the same way as they make electronics intelligence. And remember, electronics, how does that work? With zeros and ones, that's on and off switches happening constantly to make it have its intelligence. In this situation, he's used fluids to be the driving force in the control of speed and resistance. And I hopefully you'll understand this by the time we reach the end of this presentation. The VGK was developed as a strong stance control knee. And what that means is it wants to be in stance at all times. It'll never go out of stance unless you ask it to. And asking it is how you use it. But first, let's start with the most important part, and that's stance control. Stance control in this knee is by default only. It's stance by default. It has an active, active stance flexion. And stance, an active stance flexion means that it adjusts the resistance according to the force being applied. More on that later. And it's a self-regulating swing. Fluidix is a term that was developed for the VGK, and it's used in the hydraulic industry. But what we're talking about is how do you make a fluid intelligent, just like how do you make an electronic current intelligent? And how does this work? This particular knee uses two different methods to make it intelligent. One method works in stance phase of the knee. And that is <clears throat> what we call the vortex metering system. I'll talk more on it later, but in essence, what it is, if you look at this photo, you will see a spinning motion going on this picture. That's a vortex. And the speed of the fluid being spun is how fast it goes out or how slow. So it will adjust accordingly. Now, one of the key features that this knee has that's very unusual is stumble recovery. Now, as far as we know at this point, there is no video of stumble recovery happening in real time. And we believe this is the only video of that happening in real time. Notice, when it slows down, watch the toe. You'll see him catch his toe on the cobblestone when he goes from the smooth cement to cobblestone. And when he lands, he lands on a bent knee. And yet, somehow this knee knew to lock up and give him time to get to the next foot. And that's what the important part is. Now, one thing that <clears throat> people don't understand is it's 250 milliseconds is the time you need in order to fall and to catch a fall. That's one quarter of one second. And if you cannot respond faster than that, you're going down. So this is a very important feature, that this knee will react in one quarter of one second, actually faster, in order to save you from a fall. Now, <clears throat> this particular video you're looking at right now is of a gentleman that is wearing this knee for the very first time. His leg is, is uh, aligned for an electronic knee. 
So in essence, the VGK is in an unstable alignment. Now notice when he's balancing that he goes into a stance flexion mode to control the angle in his balance. What he didn't realize is he was actually doing that. He felt when the knee went into extension, then he knew that something happened, but he didn't know that he was doing a normal flexion of the knee to control the unevenness of the floor. Now, <clears throat> how does this work? This works again, remember the vortex and all how the vortex works. Now this graph, hopefully it's not too confusing, but we're talking about is the rate of the knee bending as the arrow going up and the force applied to the knee or the weight of the patient and the angle of the knee going across. Now notice the red line, that is a traditional valve knee bending under load, causing the knee to accelerate in its positioning, accelerate in its bending. Where the vortex is controlled, it levels it off. It goes so fast and then it just totally slows down the action of the knee to control that downhill speed. Now, watch this gentleman walking down the stairs, and yes, he is an amputee, and yes, he is wearing a VGK. Can you tell which knee? If you watch carefully, you can. But it's very smooth. He's also carrying a weight. He has a bag, and he's walking down these steps very smoothly. What he's doing is he's riding the knee in stance. He never allows the knee to go to full extension, so he never gets a toe load, so he can always just ride the bending of the knee. This is another stair example to give you an idea of control and the use of the VGK. Now, what you need when you're trying to walk downhill, you have a certain angle that uh, no matter what happens, the patient is never going to go into um, a swing mode. So if what's greater than 20 degrees, the odds are he's not ever going to trigger into swing. Because in order to trigger into swing, you need multiple issues going on. One, you need to have the knee into full extension. Two, you need to have a load on the toe. And three, you have to initiate that flexion. Now in this video, you're going to watch a gentleman walking on something that scares even people with two good legs. An icy, snowy path. Now as you watch him, watch his hand on the right side. He's not too sure that this knee is going to be there for him when he's going down this path. So he's riding his hand just above the rail just in case he loses his footing. And as he goes, he moves his hand away from the railing because he feels in control. He knows the knee is for him. So we're going at different angles to flat. So he's going between stance and swing as he does this path. Now setting up the VGK, very simple. Look at the weight line. Um, this is a German method of weight line. It comes off the ear goes down through the hip joint, center of the hip joint, through the knee, and through the ankle. Now notice the knee should be located between zero and 10 millimeters posterior to the weight line. Now the closer you are to zero, the more stance flexion action at mid stance you will receive. If you don't like stance flexion at mid stance, Move the knee posterior. And notice that it doesn't matter with this alignment system what your hip flexion is. The knee is located off of the hip center or the trochanter and not the distal end of the femur. This is very important key on that alignment. The very first thing we adjust is stance because remember it's about stance yielding by default. So that's the valve all the way to the left. And no, the knee you receive will not be a red valve. This is only for demonstration purpose. But you adjust this like you do all stance by default knees by having them sit. 
and adjusting it till they feel that the knee is giving them support. I like my patient to feel equal support on both knees or helping sit down. That way they preserve the life of their good knee because that's what we want. We want them to have 40, 50 years of their good knee. If the prosthetic knee doesn't help, they're gonna wear their knees out. Now, this is an example of the stance range of motion that it gives you. This woman doing a squat, look at how deep she can go. This has got the largest range of stance flexion of any knee on the market. It's approximately 70 degrees, but notice how deep she can go. She can squat, she can use this. The next thing we need to do on the adjustment is, a, is set up the swing release. And that's the toe load. That's the big screw on the bottom. And we turn it counterclockwise or anti-clockwise to make it easier to release. There is a limit to how far it should be released or backed off. It should not have a slop. They should not feel that thing moving back and forth just enough that it makes it easy enough to release. And usually you need to start with it very easy and then as time goes on, um, I want you to add a little bit more. I want them to work aggressively at releasing that foot. Where this comes into key is in a bilateral. You want to give them a little bit more resistance because you don't want to inadvertently go into swing and yet you want them to in, go into swing. Because a bilateral doesn't have a choice on loading the leg. They have to load the leg. It's very easy for them to initiate swing. But they want resistance. So we want stance to be a little more aggressive. So add a little bit more resistance to that toe load. But when we have stance and we have swing and we change angles, we have people like this guy, I gave him the job of trying to trick this knee. I want him to fail. So this is a series of things that he's doing to try to get the knee to go out of stance and into swing inadvertently that would make him go down. And he can't do it. This is the video of where we started trying to make it fail. And actually this clinic set us up. They wanted to get rid of us. And so because they get people showing them new stuff all the time and they figured we'll put this guy on it because he hates everything. And so I said, great, trick it. Anyway, long story short, he is now wearing a VGK. So he likes it so much. One thing amputees do is they learn how to walk backwards in a knee so that they're ensured that they will not go down because walking backwards is scary for amputees. This gentleman doing the educating uh, and demonstrating is very skilled at walking backwards, but notice that he walks pretty peg leg going backwards, a normal AK gait. This gentleman has worn the VGK for maybe 10 minutes and I told him, I showed him walking backwards and I said, now, I want you to go down this ramp and I want you to spin and see if you still have stability. This video was the most educational thing that I had seen. This is only two days after I received my first VGK and I had the inventor out to show me what, was, what this could do. And we went to a local school. This student wears an X3. We put it on him, and before we could even adjust it, he ran out of the room and went over to this grassy knoll and started walking away without any adjustment. Now, he heard my lecture, and in my lecture, I talk about the VGK can add an extra 35 pounds and still function the same. So in other words, they can put on a backpack and still walk fine. Well, he didn't have a backpack, but pay attention to the knee. Pay attention, particularly in slow-mo, what happens with the knee, self-evident. This will adjust 
according to the force applied automatically, seamlessly. There is no dance required. The patient just uses it. It adjusts for him. Remember, this is not electronic. This does not have any electronics, yet it's just as intelligent as electronics. Now, the last uh, little adjustment is, is about the speed of walking. Very simple. Slide this back and forth. Um, watch for heel rise. This video will show this patient walking slow to very fast. Watch the heel rise. No matter what his speed, the heel rise is the same. It controls it automatically. So here's a very fast patient walking down the thing, trying to see how quick he can walk. In fact, he walks faster than the guy that's supposed to keep an eye on him. Now another key feature about walking, walking fast or using the knee a lot, is how much heat does the hydraulics generate? What happens with heat? Heat makes fluids get thinner. Eventually, it'll turn all fluids into a gas. And vice versa, if it gets cold, eventually it will turn it into a solid. And that is the case for all hydraulics. But what we have developed here is a system that compensates for the viscosity. So no matter what the viscosity is of the hydraulics, it automatically compensates. So to the patient, they never notice a difference. It always works the same. Now, one of the interesting features that happens during swing phase is that this knee will compensate for the weight of the foot or whatever is driving the leg forward. So, for instance, if you're walking in mud, your shoe gets full of mud, it weighs more, it swings differently. So, if you pay attention to this video, you'll see this guy literally drags his foot through the dust and it doesn't matter. It still gives him the swing that he's looking for. It has another feature designed for the amputee, another positioning, and that's in the center. The center has three positions. That's a toggle. Over so that you're pushing the lever to the left, you're into normal walking mode. In the center, you're into high resistance or locking mode. And all the way to the right, you are in what's called free swing. Free swing is designed to allow no resistance in the knee or very little resistance in the knee, but it has a really unique feature. At that point, it has, still has stumble recovery. Stumble recovery is really important because, as you see in this video, you don't always remember that you're in free swing. You get off a bicycle, and now you have an issue. So this person is walking down the hill using stumble recovery to keep him from falling. In the process of building this, uh, one thing became evident without electronics, water. Water is not an issue. Um, but salt water is an issue, and regular water is an issue. Swimming pool water is an issue all of which because it is basically caustic to the metal. It'll corrode. So no, don't leave this knee soaking in water for a week. Don't take it swimming in the ocean. Don't take it swimming in the pool unless you're incredibly good at washing out all of that toxic material. But it can do it. It can go in the water. There's a rule here though for all hydraulics that over two meters or right about at two meters the hydraulic seals are not strong enough to fight against water pressure. 
And so the water pressure will invade the hydraulics and ruin them. So I have a general rule, and that is don't go any deeper than waist deep. If you don't go any deeper than waist deep or chest deep, your knee is not going to be any more than three feet down. And that's what we're saying. Three feet or one meter is maximum depth for the knee. So you can take it in the pool, play with your kids, play with your dog, not a problem. Wash it thoroughly afterwards. Now let me talk about how this works. A lot of people have said this is just another SNS. Well, let me discuss the SNS, how it works. I'm going to talk about microprocessors, how they work. And this is in generic terms. So first, SNS. What we have is we have the hydraulic ram and the speed of that ram is adjusted by a valve that controls the flow. Now the positioning of that ram also adjusts the flow and that's what the SNS was very unique at is that it allowed for a change of flow according to the angle of the knee. But it wasn't a dynamic change, it was a set change in the ports that were built into the knee. So the, the speed is determined by the positioning of the ram. The microprocessor, this is where things changed. This was very incredibly unique, something new to the field, and that was that it had the S and S type system built in for the hydraulics, but it added an auxiliary route for the hydraulics that are controlled by a microprocessor. Now the microprocessor, what it does is it senses the position of the knee it senses the ankle sensor, which is the force being applied to the leg. It takes those two, processes that information, and adjusts a valve. It's a mechanical valve for the most part in all microprocessor knees, and it has to screw in and screw out to make those adjustments. Now, this sampling and, and moving is all takes time. This is a time issue type situation. But regardless, microprocessor has another feature to make the knee respond to the forces being applied. Now we have the VGK. And this is kind of the meat of the subject here because if you notice, it has the SNS type circuit and it has a mechanical valve, a stance valve that you adjust to that individual. And it has another circuit, very much like uh, the microprocessor. And that other circuit is where the vortex metering system is in the system. And that vortex meter adjusts how fast and how much resistance in the knee. Now, let's just talk differences in knees. Let's just look at the SNS and the microprocessor to start off with. The SNS has a single parameter to initiate swing, and the microprocessor has a dual parameter. Now, when I say that, what that means is the SNS needs full extension and it goes into swing. The microprocessor not only needs full extension, it also needs a tow load to go into swing. Um, it is a manual adjustment on the SNS for flexion and swing. Um, it, you can manually adjust the microprocessor for a locking mode if you set up this knee and use a key fob to make that adjustment, where the SNS has a, a, a bail that you can move in order to lock the knee. Um, and its stance support is 30 degrees. The microprocessor stance support is approximately 30 degrees. But the microprocessor also has stumble recovery and it has an automatic swing and stance adjustability. This is a patient walking, and I want you to notice how the knee performs in speed. And we're also going to see his knee that he had prior and how it behaves with speed. Now, very quickly, I'm just going to go through some of the unique characteristics of the VGK B1 
beyond the microprocessor, beyond what we classically think of as an S, as excuse me, as a C leg microprocessor. First, it's got an auto compensating swing, which is a motion feedback system. It detects the motion of the knee and it returns with how much resistance and how fast it goes into swing. It has an auto compensating stance which is a vortex metering system. It's energy independent. What does that mean? It means you're not tethered to a wall to charge this thing. It has a standing mode that's totally intuitive. You don't have to do anything for it to stand safely. It will be there for you. And it has an unbelievably increased stability in sidestepping. And I'm talking a crab walk type sidestepping, which I will show you. It's temperature adaptive. It will adjust according to what the temperature is of the knee. It has stumble recovery and free swing, which is unique. It has incredible backwards walking without hitting a key fob, without standing in a funny position it will just start going backwards without an issue. And it's weight compensating for an additional 35 pounds. Now notice this person is focused on the ball, not on the knee. Watch the positioning of the feet of the knee. Watch his motions. Notice his use of the amputated side. Focus on the strength he's getting out of the amputated side. Focus on the stability of that knee. Focus on how he allows him to use that knee, not only for balance while carrying a heavy object in an awkward position, but stability. This is probably the scariest type of obstacle that amputees face. And that's going down a steep slope with a gravel kind of surface, no traction, and to be able to trust an above knee prosthesis on awkward, slippery slope is very difficult. Now, back to the little projects we don't always want to do, but we need to do. I want you to pay attention to how much he drives the prosthesis backwards. Uses force to move this table with his prosthesis. This is a test socket. He did have a preparatory leg and then they decided to do a revision on his leg. It's been approximately six months since you've walked. So now we're fitting the test socket, but he does have some experience with a mechanical knee that had stance flexion. I'm going to show a couple things in this video of normal, simple gait patterns that they can learn. First step is adjusting the stance yield. And the stance yield is the screw all the way to your left when you're looking at the back of the knee. That screw counterclockwise makes it yield faster, clockwise gives you more resistance. When you have the patient sit down, you want enough resistance that the knee helps them sit. But the importance is of the yield, the yield not only has them sit, that's the first setting. How do we sit? How do we control this? But it's also the function of going down a hill, going downstairs, going down any kind of ramps, any of that nature, they're going to ride the knee. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have them try this low step. So if you get on top of the step and turn around, there we go. Get your foot about halfway over the step. Now I want you to bend the knee and come down. Notice he didn't ride it. He, it was kind of stiff. So before I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to take a step back, I'm going to show you a trick that I'm using a lot now with patients to help them understand how to use yielding, how to trust it, and how to use it. So in the bars, I want you to hold on the bars. I want you to put your prosthetic leg just a little bit in front of you. There you go. That's funny. And I want you to let the knee bend and then take a step backwards with your good foot. Good. Now keep doing that. Try to keep it going. 
There we go. You feel the way it has resistance, it has control. There we go. Good. That's a little slow. It's a little bit too much strength there. It's a little hard for him to bend it, but it gives him time to take a step backwards. So I work this technique with clients, and they get to understand yield. They understand they have time. They can do this. They can ride it. All right, let's try, before I make an adjustment, let's go ahead and try the step again. There we go. But did you hear the shoe is still catching? It's a little bit too much resistance for him, so I'm going to turn it down just a hair. So I'm always finding, first, most important part is security. You want to make sure they feel secure. And I just moved it a hair. All right, let's try it again. Go backwards first. There we go. Does that feel a little faster now? Yes. Okay. Good. Let's try the step. Still a little slow. I'm going to back it off a little more. Okay. Backwards first. There we go. All right. Good. There we go. So what you want is you don't want them to crash. You don't want them to land fast, but you want them to have resistance so he has time for the next step. That does a couple things. One, it gives him a natural gait going down steps. And two, it preserves his ankle and his knee from crashing on every step. So it's a real important adjustment. This I can do in the bars. Once you have that established and you have the correct TKA alignment set up with the knee, you are ready to walk the patient. Before I do, I'm going to have you sit one more time and try that resistance. Okay, that looks more natural than what you had before. It's faster, okay, but this is more appropriate for your weight. All right, so this is really important that the yield is set up in the bars first before you take them out and work ramps. If they know how to back up, ramps are a piece of cake. They're not as scared. They don't go as peg leg. They don't try to get off of it. They try to ride it. So try this technique. It's really, really easy as far as stance yielding is concerned. The first thing you want to do with the walk is if they trigger the knee and they get it into swing, excellent. If they don't trigger the knee and they can't start swing, you back off this big screw down here. This bumper adjust how much force the toe lever of the foot gives to initiate swing. It's simply a, a switching mechanism down here and as you back it up it makes it easier for it to switch into swing. It needs two things to switch. One is a toe lever to move the switch and the other is full extension of the knee. Once you figure that out if you have some motion down here and you can see it and feel and the patient will feel it, you've backed this off too far. Simply bring it in until the urethane's in contact and you won't have that slop. Okay. Yeah. You can feel the difference when it's easy to release. You don't have to think about it, it just releases. You don't want them to work so hard to release it. Now, the important part at this aspect, because we're doing a test socket fitting, fortunately, he's young and willing and putting a lot of pressure in the socket. If they do not load the socket, they do not get a release. If they do not get a release, back that off until it's fairly loose and come in like a quarter of a turn. And once you come in that quarter turn, it'll go off and on. And then you can teach them how to get into swing. If they've never experienced swing, they won't know what the difference between stance and swing. Step number three is to reduce the heel rise, okay, or to make it have more heel rise. Most people start off with this lever slid all the way over to the right side as you look at it. It's right up here, slide it to the right. It comes out of the box that way, but just in case, slide it all the way to the right before you walk your patient. Make it easy. Heel rise.
guys is this little toggle up here and it's a slide. You just pull it over. Right is easy, left is, is firm. Let's watch you walk and let's watch the heel rise. Try to compare it to the sound side. It, at the moment it's pretty equal and it's really way down so we don't have to worry about it. It doesn't have any terminal impact and so I'm not going to make any adjustments. I'm going to let him get used to using the leg. I didn't tell him to but it, uh, he's all of a sudden walking without his hands which is in a test socket. So it's okay. But that means he's loading the socket, he's getting a very equal gait. It's also, this is bench alignment. I have not touched any of the alignment on this thing. So we have not changed toe levers. We have not changed anything that's straight out of the back bench alignment. If that is not enough, you simply go down to the swing yield. Now this yield affects the mechanism of the entire knee. That is designed to be able to make the difference between a patient that has their foot mounted at the bottom of the knee and a patient has a long shin section. Okay, Different fulcrums need different resistance in the entire cylinder. This, turn it counterclockwise, it makes it easier to swing. Clockwise makes it more resistance. This has a stop when you go counterclockwise, so, and it's very obvious, it's nice and smooth till you come to stop. Do not go and power through that stop. You can break it. This is the very last thing you're going to adjust. Adjust this first. If this will not do the job, then you come down here. If they're not having a good time, an easy time going into swing, it's the toe load that needs to be tuned. Not that. The toe load first. This bar is pointing to the stairs. That's walking mode. The middle, when this toggle goes to the middle, that's locked and that's free swing. This knee is not designed to walk in free swing or in the lock mode. It's designed to walk in the walking mode, the stair setting. Okay? You can walk in both of those in short term but it's best to be in the walking mode to use the knee. In the future, what I'm going to do with him, when he gets to know the knee, I'm going to fine tune going down ramps. I'm going to fine tune the yield in particular. I want the yield to work just right. And more importantly, I'm going to fine tune where the toe load is, the big screw in the back, how that adjustment is, because that's timing. If I have too much, it's too late in the gate that it releases. If it's too little, it's too early in the game that it releases into swing. So I can tune the timing of release into swing. But I'm not doing that today because this is all new to, to this particular client. So anyway, test socket fittings, you should be able to do a lot of alignment with it. Okay. So this is something different new, This right? is different and new. So this is going to take you a few playing in the parallel bars in front of the mirror and figure out how that works for you. You know what I'm saying? It's a whole new range for you. Def a, a cool range, though. And not bad. That's how you press this way. Come back through. And then, because we, there's a move that you go like this. Right. Okay. And that... If you initiate the bend, then it does it like more natural motion. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's doing the more natural than. Right. If, so and I'm, like I said, as long as because Shisha can will be able to get me to help to break. Oh, that looks cool. See what I mean? Mm-hmm. But wow. Well. It's fine. No, it's fine. Where how far? How to make it through how to, the window. How to how to push it. make it smooth. There you go. That's, that's better. This is just another bone down. Yeah, that's, a, that's still a little bit dense. So it must be broken a little bit. But, but yeah. <laughs>